Hey, good morning, everybody. Good to see you guys. This morning, that was awesome. I could do that all day long. That was, that was incredible. So uh, congratulations to everybody that got dunked this morning. That is, um, th- those are just good moments. So we're going to continue our verse-by-verse study through the book of Mark. We're going to turn the page to chapter 3. And uh, so I'll just start us off, and, and then we'll unpack these verses here. So good to be, you're about to three. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal on the Sabbath, so they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent, and he looked around at them with anger, grieved at the hardness of heart, and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him on how to destroy him. So you look at these verses, and you see Jesus was angry. And in my goal to be more like Jesus, I am now validating my anger today. So I'm a little mad at the lead pastor of the church, to be honest. So I was here last week, as I normally am, and I'm in the back, and I'm pacing around during worship, and, and I sit, I stand there against the cafe there and, and listen to, to Taylor preach. He comes up, and he starts talking about Sabbath. And I'm thinking, well... My scripture next week has a lot to do with Sabbath, and that's kind of where I was going to go. Maybe he'll just brush on it, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll, I'll just follow it up. But he didn't brush on it, did he? No, he swept the whole 30 minutes. Sabbath, 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 Sabbath. There, And I'm back there pacing like, okay, we're gonna, Lord, we're going to have to pivot here a little bit because uh, I don't want to double up. So that's what we're doing here this morning. We're pivoting a little bit. Uh, but... I do want to go back to it just a little bit because it was a convicting message, wouldn't you agree? Like it, it was, it's, it's always good when you, you preach a sermon and, and you're still thinking about it or you listen to a sermon and you're still thinking about it, you know, later that day. And so that afternoon I was thinking, you know, I need to be a little bit more intentional about adding specific time to rest, to reflect, to pray, to Sabbath. And it's a blessing gift that we get from God. But wouldn't you also agree that sometimes our lives are just chaos? And, and things happen and things that, that we didn't even consider life. And, and they happen to us and we have to adjust and we have to adapt. And, and a lot of times we're just busy and we're full of expectations. But wouldn't you also agree that sometimes in life, the chaos that we're experiencing is basically the consequences of the decisions that we have already made? And so I bring you back to last Sunday. I was at home in my office readjusting the, you know, pivot, you know, so we're, we're working on the sermon and Brandy texts me, my wife, didn't say a word, just sends me a photo. Two hours later, we have this thing living with us. (laughs) Yeah, cute, isn't he? Little demon-possessed thing. I kid you not. Ten weeks old, he chews my feet. He's clawed and chewed my face. I'm working on the... He's chewing up the, the cords that we have. I'm scratched up. I'm beat up. I look like a horror movie. And then in the meantime, he has destroyed our remote control... We have to buy a new one. And he's literally trying to eat our table, our dining room table, our our coffee table. He's eating it. It's like Lilo and Stitch over at our house, but it's constant. (laughs) But he's cute. And so I'll give him that. But we got to take that off because no one's going to pay attention to me if that picture's still up there. But what I wanted to do is actually take a question this week in our small group. So every small group, we, we, we... we write out questions for the week. I'm going to actually take one from last week's sermon and, and ask us how we're dealing with being intentional about adding that time of rest and reflection because I'm hoping and I'm praying that you're a lot better at it than I am. 
but we want to be doers of the word, not just hearers. And so I hope that you are, are actually being intentional about trying to find that time of rest and reflection and prayer and work. But this morning, since we are pivoting a little bit, we are going to look through the eyes of the three main characters in this passage. We're going to look through the eyes of the Pharisees. We're going to look through the eyes of Jesus. And finally, we're going to look through the eyes of the man in need. So if you look through the eyes of the Pharisees, we see what they wanted to do right from the start. Verse 2 says, And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so they might accuse him. They wanted to catch the sinless man in sin, breaking the Sabbath, breaking the rules of the law. And studying this actually made me want to be even more like Jesus because the truth is he's a little bit of a pot stirrer. He goes in there to the synagogue. It's Sabbath. And he knows that these people are going to just, the feathers are just going to get ruffled if he heals this man. And it's not like he, pro- he just happened to have a withered hand. He probably lived with it for a while. And the thing is, is he probably would have been fine the next day. And so he could have gone to the guy and just said, hey, I see you. I love you. My heart is for you. Today's the Sabbath. Let me meet you here tomorrow. And tomorrow your hand is going to be healed. The guy would have been elated. But he didn't do that. And he knew that the Pharisees were going to get all uptight. But I think there's two reasons why Jesus chose to heal that man on that day. One, he has a heart of compassion and care for other people. That's who he is. That's his nature. He can't help it. That's what his desire is. That's what his heart is. Second, he was challenging the legalistic traditions that they held so valuable. The passage is really fundamental in breaking down two ideas of what religion is. So to the Pharisees, religion was a ritual. It was rules. It was regulations. And it was living up to certain expectations. And Jesus broke those regulations by when, and they were genuinely convinced because of that, that Jesus was a bad man, plotting to kill him. So to the Pharisees, religion was a ritual, but to Jesus, it was service. It was people. It was loving God and loving others. Ritual is irrelevant when you compared it to love in action. So to Jesus, the most important thing in the world was was not correct performance of a ritual, but the answer to the cry of human need. And what he's saying and what he's trying to to share with us in this passage is that Jesus didn't come to change religion or to reform religion. He actually came to end it and replace it with himself. The gospel is not religion. So religion is I give God something and then he's going to give me something back. He's going to bless me because I'm performing, because I'm doing these certain things. And and, and I'm a good person. And so God needs to treat me good. And so does everybody else because I'm a spiritual elite person. But Christianity is saying that God, through Jesus, gives you complete salvation, which you receive by grace. And then because of that gift, I'm going to respond and live my life according to him. In religion, you're saved by trying to do better than everybody else. And you live by the way of performance. In other words, you're saved when you try to be better than anybody. But in the gospel, Christianity, you're you're only saved when you admit that you're absolutely no better than anybody else. And that you're basically, in many ways, all sorts of ways, spiritually and a moral failure, and we need a savior. Religion is a roller coaster ride, and a lot of us are on it. I obey, therefore, I'm accepted. And that leads to either self righteousness or spiritual deadness, depending on the day. It either leads to superiority and spiritual elitism. Look, I'm going to check all the boxes. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. And look how spiritual I am. And and look at God. God, look at how spiritual I am. You people, look how spiritual I am. And you have this superiority. Or you're going to be filled with anxiety, fear, and depression when you don't meet those expectations. It's so easy for us, church, to, to actually make that exchange. And, And so God... 
wants us to have freedom with our relationship with him. Jesus purchased freedom, and so often we exchange it for the straitjacket of legalism. We exchange it for the straitjacket of rules and, and regulations and, and, and allowing those rules and regulations to be more important to us than the actual relationship that Jesus desires for us. And isn't it ironic, though, too, that the Pharisees actually accused Jesus of breaking the law that day when they actually broke it themselves? And they're here to say that this is the law that, that we want to stand by. This is the law that we want to protect. But they actually broke it themselves by plotting to kill Jesus. I mean, that's a business meeting. That's work. But they did. They, 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 changed, they, they actually, and the reason why Jesus was so angry is because, look, I'm, I'm doing good and you're mad at that. You're angry at that. You think I'm evil because of that. So the question that we have to work through when, when we work through our relationship with the Lord is, is, am I living in the freedom of having an authentic relationship with Jesus Christ or am I wearing that straitjacket of legalism? Do I do what I do out of love and gratitude to the Lord who saved me or do I do it out of expectation and guilt? And do I know that my salvation is a gift given by faith, and I'm continuing to work, or am I continuing to work just to gain favor of God or other people? Ephesians 2 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. Is it a gift from God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So our, our role is just to stay low before the Lord, stay humble, and realize that, that we have everything we need in Jesus, and he just desires that relationship with us. That he, does, he loves us, we don't have to perform. We, we actually live out the spiritual practices because of our desire and our love and our gratitude towards him, not because he's requiring it and he's a God in there that's gonna slap us if we don't perform. You don't have to perform to earn God's love. So then let's look through the eyes of Jesus. I think we can learn two quick things right away through the eyes of Jesus here in this, this passage. One, God is compelled to love other people. That's always his goal. He wants to love, he wants to serve, he wants to care that his kindness is towards other people. His kindness was towards this man with the withered hand and his kindness is towards you guys as well. It's towards me. God is compelled to love other people, but he's also angered at anything that tries to prevent that love from happening. And you look through this story and, and you see the heart and the intention is to do good for Jesus. And the Pharisees realized Jesus wanted to help and so they watched him. Because they knew as soon as he walked in and saw this man, his heart was going to be drawn to him. And so they watched and they wanted to catch him. And this is how awesome Jesus is. And this is why it's just my heart's desire to be more like him. Because as most people, when people are going through pain and suffering, we try to kind of block and put that boundary and walk away. Jesus is drawn into people's pain. He's towards them. He wants to, to, to help them through it. He wants to be there with them. And in the synagogue, all eyes were on him because everybody knew what Jesus wanted to do. And I think there's something for us to learn from that is that when people that we love and care for are going through pain and hurt and suffering, we don't have to kind of step back and, and not get involved to protect ourselves. We want to step into that pain with them because these are the people that God has put together for us. We're, each, we're, for, we're in for each other. And someday you're gonna need those people back at you. Be drawn to people's pain. In Jesus, we see the heart of God and he didn't get, let anything get in the way for him to minister and love and care for this man. Jesus was the holiest man in that room. And even though the Pharisees thought that they were probably the holiest, you can't compete with a guy that's never sinned. And his heart was towards that man. In his holiness, Jesus made a decision. 
I'm going to care for him. I don't care what day it is on the calendar. I don't care what you people think over here. My heart is towards you. And in Matthew's account, he actually, we learned that he actually said this to the Pharisees as well during this time. In Matthew 12, it says, which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into the pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Or how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Jesus saw this man as one of his sheep. He was a shepherd. Much more valuable than sheep. And he understood that it was good for him to actually help and serve and heal this man. And the fact that the Pharisees could not approve of such a good and loving action because of religion or their interpretation of that, that angered Jesus. Because God is angered by anything or anyone that tries to block the love of God and the love of other people. Jesus said the most important commandment is to love God and then love your neighbor as yourself. Mark 12, Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Have you ever noticed that Jesus, when he gets angry, he doesn't get angry at people that are sitting and and don't know him, that don't have a relationship with him. He's angry at the self-righteous. He's angry at people that try to block his love and love for other people. The sad thing about the Pharisees is that we see over and over and over again that their love of God was actually replaced for their love of religion. And Jesus comes along And he changes all of that. And he basically says, where good needs to be done, there can be no neutrality. The failure to do good when good can be done is actually to contribute to the evil. Now, a few of us in this room, we have our men's group on Monday nights here. And and we're studying a few things. We're going through James now. but, But before that, we actually were going through this book. And in this book, there was a quote by Edmund Burke. And it just stirred a lot of us. And we kept referring back to it. It says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. There's a lot of truth to that. Like there's a lot of evil out there. And a lot of times we think the Christian thing to do is just kind of be passive and just love. Bible says here, Jesus was angry. And that's a good question that we can wrestle with and ask ourselves is, is what are you angry about? And on those things that you're angry about, would Jesus be angry of of those things as well? And if the answer is yes, then are you dealing with that anger the same way Jesus would? Or are you dealing it with, uh, on an unhealthy, unbiblical way? There's nothing wrong with being angry. There's nothing wrong with doing good when good needs to be done. And I'm thankful that I have a savior that actually looks at this man and says, I have a heart for you. I love you. I care for you. I'm here for you. I'm going to heal you. I don't care what day it is. I'm going to heal you because I know that that same man would do the same for me. And he's going to do the same for you. So what, who is this man? Let's look through the eyes of the man in need now. Can you imagine sitting in a place You're going through whatever you're going through, fear, anxiety, depression, addiction, sickness, loneliness, whatever it is that that you're going through, whatever it is that weight is that you brought in here with that nobody knows about, and you're there, you're minding your own business, and in walks the man that can change your whole world, that can fix all of that. That's what happened to this man in this passage. And Jesus says, I'm going to change your world. And he looks at him and says, stretch out your hand. Did you notice when Jesus speaks to the man and commands him to stretch out his hand, that he actually stretches out his withered hand? Why didn't he stretch out his good hand? And I know you're thinking is, well, that's pretty obvious. 
stretch out the withered hand because that's what you want healed. But if we're honest with each other, don't we always stretch, usually stretch out our good hand? Isn't that what we do often? We try to cover up the things in life that need healing. We cover up the things in life that are broken. We cover up the things in life that actually need a touch from God. And all we do is, in exchange of that is simply show areas of life where we have it all together. And we act like everything's fine. I'm fine. The biggest lie in Christianity. But you, see, you hear it all the time. I'm fine. I'm fine. And we're not. And in our brokenness, in our hurt, and our pain, we post things on social media that, that show a very opposite life. And that's what makes Jesus so upset is that attitude of you don't have to have it all together. It's okay. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. And the thing is, is that we as Christians have so much to celebrate, so much to praise for, so much to rejoice, so much to be thankful for. We should be the happiest people on earth because we have eternity. At the same time, we live in a broken world and there's pain and there's sickness and there's loss and there's hurt and we all have to deal with. And I believe Jesus is saying, stretch out your hand. Whatever is withered up in your life, God can make it whole. And I think we work so hard to put our best foot forward or in our hand in this case. And Jesus is saying, just give me what's broken. Give me the broken parts of your life. What's hidden can't be healed. And so the question that we have to answer, church, I have to answer, you have to answer, is what is your withered hand? And bring it to Jesus. Now, we could keep stretching our good hand and showing our good side and checking those boxes and hiding your sin and, and, and continue to post a life of joy and happiness and contentment on social media while inside you're just full of pain and suffering and it's very opposite of what you're showcasing the world. And you keep stretching out your good hand and you keep stretching out your good hand and you're gonna continue to be in pain you're going to continue to suffer. You're going to continue to go through what you're going through because you are too proud to actually reach out to Jesus, the one that can actually do something, and say, here's my brokenness, here's my pain, I'm stretching out to you. You'll never be free. You'll never be whole until you actually go to the one that can actually heal you of what's broken. You want a real touch from God Stretch out your brokenness. Amen. Your strength, your religion, your act, that's not gonna get you close to God. It, what, what, what you need is to actually, re, he's gonna reach out to you when you reach out to him in your humility and your brokenness and say, God, I believe you can heal this. But you have to be willing to expose your weakness. You can't be, you have to be bold. You have to be dependent enough on God to, to say, Lord, I'm addicted to this. This is my pain and I'm feeling it right now. This is my sin that nobody else, including the person next to me, knows that I'm going through. This is my, this is where I, I doubt myself. This is where I'm fearing. This is my anxiety. This is where I'm lonely. This is, this is my sickness. This is where I need healing. And your job is to simply extend that to the one, just like this man did in this passage, that can actually do something about it. You could be a child of God and you could still be bound. Here's the truth. Every Sunday you can walk into a church here in Whatcom County or any in the United States, and what you're gonna see is you're gonna see broken people. You're gonna see destroyed people. You're gonna see people depressed. You're gonna see people that are suicidal. You're gonna see people that are bound and addicted and struggling and full of fear and doubt and anxiety. And they're walking around as if everything is okay. And they pass opportunity after opportunity to actually get touched by the man that can actually heal them of all of it. There are people in this room right now with real hurts 
and real pain and real brokenness and real depression and real anger and real loss. And it's time to get real with Jesus about those things. Second Corinthians 12, he said, my grace is sufficient for you. Some of you need to hear these words today. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. My grace is sufficient for you. Jesus is enough. He is what you need. God is a God that turns tragedy into triumph. God is a God that will turn weakness into strength. He will turn brokenness into wholeness. And you notice in this verse here, Paul's suffering when he said this. And God never gave him an answer why he was suffering. All he responded and says, my grace is sufficient. And some of you here are in the same boat. You're going through trials, you're going through tragedy, you're going through loneliness and brokenness and hurt and pain and sickness, and you're wondering, God, why me? Why am I going through this? Why am I having to suffer with this? Why is this weight I have to carry? Why me? And God is saying, my grace is sufficient. Praise God, because of faith, we don't have to live on expectations and explanations, we just live on promises. And those promises don't change, even though sometimes we change. Stretch out your hand. Stretch out your pain. Stretch out your pain in the direction that actually, towards someone that can actually do about it. And here's the thing. The world is going to say, give you all the medication you need for whatever it is that you brought in here with you. It's going to say, you want relief of anxiety? Take this pill. You want to feel better? Watch this. Drink this. Stretch out for the bottle. Stretch out for the drug. Stretch out for the escape. And, and watch, binge watch Netflix all day and just live vicariously through someone else. Go ahead and post what you want to post. Stretch out to the computer screen and live, live through them. And you're going to get this temporary fix that's going to leave you empty, broken, and discouraged. Don't stretch out for the temporary when Jesus says an eternal fix is for the taking. Stretch out your hand. Worship team, you guys can come on up. If you're serving communion, come on up as well. I'm really glad we pivoted this week. Because this, is, this has been wrecking me all week long because I, it, it's so easy to show everybody that you have it together, that everything is okay with me. And it, to the point you're actually will start fooling yourself and think that you have it all together. And you just have to stretch out your brokenness. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. There are people in this room this morning that are brokenhearted. The Lord is near you. There are people here this morning that are crushed in spirit. The Lord is near you. And you feel like you're running on empty. You feel like the weight of the world and the expectations of people are on your shoulders and you just don't know how long you can bear that anymore. Or you're feeling like, hey, I'm at this stage in my life and this is not where I wanted to be. Why can't I have the blessings of other people are going through? Why am I dealing with this? Why is my life like this? And you're here and you feel the burden of the expectations of your family and friends and everybody around you and that feels weighty and it's heavy. Or you hear and you wake up one morning and the, the crushing sound of silence is your life. And you understand you got another day alone. You're here and you have suffered loss. You're here and, and you're having a hard time forgiving someone. You're here and you're sick and you need a miracle. Stretch out your hand. 
not to what the world gives you, not what the world wants to give you to ease your pain. Because on the other side of that is oftentimes guilt, shame, and emptiness. It's time to stretch out your hand to the one that will never leave you, the one that will never forsake you, the one that is for you and not against you. Reach out to the one that loves you so much that he chose to endure torture and pain on a cross so you don't have to. Philippians 4, 19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The question we have to answer, church, this morning is why would we reach for anything else when God will supply everything that we ever need? Stretch out your hand. So we stand with me. We're gonna spend some time just in ministry right now. We're gonna have communion. And I just wanna encourage you guys as you prepare your hearts and your minds to, for communion is to be intentional with this moment. There are things that you guys have brought into this building that you're carrying that none of us will know. There's stuff that you're bringing in that most people don't know and you're just harboring it yourself. You're carrying it yourself to protect people that you love and care for. There are here people that you need healing relationally, physically, emotionally. Communion is a beautiful time to actually stretch out your hand to Jesus. And the beauty of communion is what it represents. We can stretch our hand out to Jesus because first he stretched his out to us. And he did that on the cross. He first loved us. And that same Jesus that healed that man that day might be just saying to you, stretch out your hand. So I encourage you to use this time to be prayerful, to be intentional, and come up and receive the cup, receive the, the bread, and, and understand truly what this represents. But then before you partake, you go back to your seat. What is it that God is asking you to stretch out? What is that brokenness that you brought in that you need to actually now give it to the Lord? Stretch out your hand. And for some of us, if you have not accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, you don't know what that's like, I'm gonna ask you just to, to stay at your seat during communion, or even better yet, you can come see me. I'm gonna be at the right, uh, my right of the stage. I would love to talk to you about who this man is who loves you, cares for you, died for you, and can heal you of all the stuff that you have in you right now. There is a better life through Christ than going through day to day to day, just riding that roller coaster. So let me pray for you, and then we'll take communion together. Father, we love you. And I just want to thank you, God, that we're not bound by rules and expectations. That, Father, that you're not an angry God towards us. You're, you have a heart that is for us. You love us. And so it is an honor and a privilege to take communion together. I just feel that right now. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to come to the communion table right now. And so, Father, will you speak to each and every one of us? Will you show us our withered hand? And God, will you give us the boldness to own it, the humility to accept it, and the dependence to ask you to heal it? And Father, will you be present during this time God, just speak to us, move and direct us, move our hearts, direct our hearts. And Lord, will this be a, a, an intimate, real moment between a Savior and those that you love. And we give you praise and honor in the middle of all of it. We 
love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys can come forward. We have three tables in the front, three in the back. Come forward whenever you're ready.